Okay, can you guys see my screen? Oh, sorry. No. no. Can't see my screen, I have to share it. Sorry about that, one second. Share screen. All right, week three, treatment of anxiety and psychosis. I kept the, the, the first same slides for the first couple of weeks so that we can just go over it real quickly, all right? Remember, know a neuron, understand how an action potential works, all right? How the genetic material is gonna be in the soma and all the magic happens there, okay? Understand that the presynaptic neuron is gonna to have to communicate with a postsynaptic neuron, right? And there's receptors in the postsynaptic neuron. There's also receptors on the presynaptic neuron. And those are normally autoreceptors, which regulate release of the neurotransmitter through a negative feedback loop, okay? So remember, the presynaptic neuron, eventually once a lot of neurotransmitters come out, some of it's gonna reach, go to the back or bind to those autoreceptors. That's gonna shut off the release. That's what stops um, excitotoxicity, okay? You also have enzymes in the outside of the cell, like um, catechol-O-methyltransferase, and you have monoamine oxidase, which is inside of the cell, which eats up all of the exon neurons. Anything that goes inside the vesicle is protected, all right? Just remember, if it goes inside the vesicle, so it has to go through, so let's say serotonin comes out of the neurotransmitter, right, presynaptically. It gets sucked back in through the serotonin transport pump, right? And it's not safe just being inside of the neuron. It has to be put inside those uh, vesicular monoamine transport vesicles, which you see right there, vesicle, and that's what's going to keep it safe. Because anything that doesn't go inside the vesicle is not going to be recycled. It's actually going to be eaten up. That's the same mechanism when you give someone a monoamine oxidase inhibitor or a VMAT inhibitor. So VMAT inhibitor, which we use for tonic dyskinesia, which we're going to talk a little bit about later, is it stops meds from going inside that vesicle. It stops the neurotransmitters from going inside that vesicle. I'm sorry. So if it doesn't go inside that vesicle, it's going to get eaten up and it's going to actually reduce the amount of dopamine uh, transmission that's going to come out. Okay. We're going to explain why that's significant later on. Taxon neurotransmitter, remember anterior grade going from presynaptic to postsynaptic, retrograde going from postsynaptic to presynaptic. All right. Volume neurotransmission that happens in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex because you do not have dopamine transport pumps in the prefrontal cortex. All right. Dopamine is sucked back up using nets, which is norepinephrine transport. That's why you give someone atomoxetine, right? Even though we're not talking about ADHD right now, it increases norepinephrine reuptake, but it also increases dopamine there because it, it blocks the pump and it can't suck dopamine back up. So you're increasing norepinephrine and dopamine indirectly, okay? Targets of neurotransmitters, remember tra 12 transmembrane, it means the protein goes in and out of the membrane 12 times. An example of that would be an SSR, uh, SSRI, SNRI, any of the pumps for, for the most part, right? G protein link, that's gonna take a little bit longer to work and that's your D2 receptors, which is significant in psychosis, 5-HT2A, which is also significant in mood disorders and uh, psychosis, 5-HT2C, right, which we talked about before, um, can cause weight gain, but also has mood uh, properties, helps mood, and also helps with psychosis, believe it or not. 5-HT1A um, is the dopamine accelerator. So when you when you have a drug that binds to that, it increases dopamine in the good parts of the brain, right? The mesocortical area to increase negative symptoms and improve negative symptoms, I'm sorry. And uh, in the nigrostriatal area, when you increase dopamine there, it helps with movement disorders, all right? So we're going to talk about atypical antipsychotics, or second generation antipsychotics later on. And some of the distinguishing factors are their 5-HT2A antagonists, and some of them are even 5-HT1A partial agonists or 5-HT1A full agonists, all right? 5-HT7 is usually uh, an antidepressant effect and helps with cognition, okay? Upregulation, downregulation. That's also important to know, okay? If you block a receptor, what's gonna happen? Is it gonna upregulate or downregulate when you block it? Upregulate. Very good, right? Because that postsynaptic neuron is is it wants more stimulation. It's losing it from from the blockade. So what it's going to do is going to create more uh, receptors to get that stimulation. At the same time, there's going to be sensitization. They usually go hand in hand. Upregulates and becomes more sensitive, right? If you're stimulating the receptor too much to protect itself from excitatory toxicity, it's going to downregulate. It's going to decrease the amount of neurotransmitters, and it's also going to desensitize. Okay. That's just not the neuron. So I don't know if you guys remember from, um, from pathophysiology, I teach that class also, hormones do the same thing. Every receptor in your body has the ability to upregulate and downregulate, all right? Even with like thyroid hormone. If you have too much T4, T3, what's gonna happen is eventually your thyroid receptor is actually gonna downregulate also. So not just in the brain, all over the body. Agonist spectrum, really understand this also. An agonist mimics the activity of a full acting neurotransmitter, right? A naturally acting neurotransmitter. 
Partial agonist works both ways. If there's too much stimulation, it's going to work as a net antagonist. If there's not enough, it's going to work as an agonist. An antagonist just blocks, all right? But there's still going to be intrinsic activity. An inverse agonist is there's going to be no activity, right? There's going to be no second messengers. None of the cascades going to happen. It's going to shut it down, okay? Question. Yes. So um, the agonist, so it just does what the cell normally does. It doesn't like speed up or uh, cause more like activity? No. The only thing that does that is a ligand gated. So give someone a positive allosteric modulator, right? Like a PAM, for instance, for GABA. Mm -hmm. That will actually increase the amount. But if you're just going to give someone a regular agonist, no, it's going to be the exact same thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So remember, positive allosteric modulator, which is a ligand gated, that, that would be benzodiazepines. It doesn't go on the receptor, but it goes on a positive allosteric site. That's on the on, on the side of it. And what that's going to do is when the neurotransmitter actually binds on it, it's going to cause more of, a, of an effect, all right? So for GABA, more chloride is going to go inside the cell, right? The cell is going to repolarize, and it's going to be hard for it to have an action potential, right? Because it will become more negative. Okay, pharmacokinetics, remember, understand absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion, okay? Just understand those concepts. Understand the drug interactions with inhibitors, inducers, rapid metabolizer means that that person is eating up the drug. The drug's going to have no effect. If you're giving a patient a medication and they're taking the meds and there's no effect, but at the same time, there's no side effects either, I would be worried. Maybe they're a fast metabolizer. Say you're giving them a very strong D2 blocker, right? And you expect them to have some kind of side effect, whether it's like muscle stiffness or even sedation, and they're not experiencing any of that. So you wonder, are they really taking the meds? If they are, maybe they're rapidly metabolizing. You have to push it up, okay? Slow metabolizer. Give them a very low dose of the medication, and then they have really bad side effects, right? You put them on... Fluoxetine, 10 milligrams, they're adult. Usually we start at 20 for fluoxetine. And all of a sudden they're having really bad side effects. Maybe they're slow metabolizers. Or they were given an inhibitor, right? Those things can happen. They were given, I don't know, they were, they were, they were giving something that was an inhibitor of the medication they're taking and it's increasing the plasma drug levels of that medication, okay? Pharmacodynamics, how does the drug work in the body? What receptors does it bind to, okay? So if I say something is a pharmacokinetic interaction, Something's happening with that drug in which the full absorption of the drug is not happening, right? Or the drug is not being metabolized appropriately and it's staying in the body long enough and it's causing more side effects or it's not being excreted and it's causing more side effects. So, or there's an inhibitor on board or an inducer and the, drug, and, and the drug is causing side effects or it's not causing any effect. Those are considered pharmacokinetic interactions. Pharmacodynamic, you think someone has major depressive disorder, you're increasing serotonin and you make them manic, right? Wrong target. That's a pharmacodynamic interaction, okay? Just have a general understanding of the pathways, understand that serotonin innervates a large part of the brain and so does norepinephrine, okay? So remember, our drugs don't just target one part of the brain. That's why there's side effects sometimes or there's effects that we don't want. Sometimes we use side effects to our advantage. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about in schizophrenia, how we use side effects uh, to our advantage. Okay, just again, down regulation of the 5-HT1A autoreceptor. That's the reason why it takes so long for medications to work, right? It's not as simple as there's not enough monoamines. So you have to wait for that genetic material, that genetic cascade to happen, right? In order to for the cell to say, look, there's too much stimulation. We need to start reducing our, our, um, our receptors. And, and, and that down regulation is going to take time, which takes about two to four weeks, which is why that's how long it takes our meds to work, right? Same thing for, we're going to talk about uh, anti-anxiety today. If you give someone an SSRI for anxiety, it actually takes longer. So for depression, we usually say, you know, two to four weeks. For anxiety, four to six weeks usually. So it's a little bit longer. These are the malfunctioning brain circuits in, in anxiety. All right. Just a general sense. So there's the fear circuit, right? Which is the amygdala. You understand the amygdala is the, is the emotional part of our brain, right? It's part of the limbic system. So that's called the fear circuit. So PBN stands for parabrachial nucleus. And that's, that's when someone is having a panic attack and they're having issues breathing, right? The respiratory rate's going up. Usually that's the parabrachial nucleus of, of the brain, right? That's usually in the brain stem. Locus ceruleus, I'm sorry, that's, I put ceruleum, but locus ceruleus is, is, the, is the part of the brain where the cell bodies of, of uh, norepinephrine come from. So if the amygdala is stimulating the locus ceruleus, what's gonna happen? It's gonna tell locus ceruleus to keep, 
secreting more norepinephrine, right? Which is going to bind to your beta receptors and cause a fight or flight response. Okay, that's when people usually have panic attacks. Tachycardia, right? Elevated blood pressure, hyperarousal. They might start sweating. They might feel very tense, okay? Periaqueal gray. These are on the style book, by the way, if you're wondering what, what they stand for. PAG, periaqueal gray, stands for um, avoidance. So when the amygdala goes to that part of the brain, someone wants to avoid something, right? If someone has a phobia, afraid of spiders, or I don't know, afraid of heights. When they see that fear, it's going to stimulate the power aqueal gray part of the brain, and they're going to avoid it, right? They can't avoid it. Hippocampus, obviously, is memories. So if something was, was traumatic or something scared you in the past, that feedback is going to go back to your amygdala. And of course, your amygdala can go back to your PBN, cause you to, to breathe faster, right? Your amygdala is going to catch your locus aurelius, increase your norepinephrine, fight or flight response, right? And you might try to avoid it if your amygdala connects to your PAG. See how everything kind of works together? Um, OFC stands for orbital frontal cortex. And that's really, you know, your affect of fear and anterior cingulate uh, cortex, ACC. Anterior cingulate cortex is also part of your affect part of fear, all right? OFC also has a, a role in, in schizophrenia because that's hyperactive with people who are very aggressive. So ACC is also implicated in um, uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, okay? We're going to talk about that when we talk about that later on. In the worry loop, when you're worried and someone's ruminating and, and, and worrying about, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow, I'm worried about my exam tomorrow, right? So right now you guys are scared about your, your midterm, which is understandable. So right now you have hyperactivity in your cortical, which is your cortex, your striatal, which is your striatum, that's your movement area. So you might be fidgeting, you might be moving in your chair, right? Your thalamic, which is your thalamus, really station of your brain, so everything has to go through your thalamus, going back to your cortex. So your cortex is going down to your striatum, your movement area, back to your thalamus, which is the, you know, the regulatory system. Everything goes through their relay system, back to your cortex. So hyperactivity of the CSTC is implicated in worry, all right? So if there was an exam or someone said, I don't know, I was curious, what part of your brain is implicated in worry? You would say the cortical, striatal, thalamo, cortical, okay? Someone says, what part of your brain is hyperactive and anxiety? You can say amygdala, and the amygdala has connections to all these other parts of your brain, right? Parabrachial nucleus. Breathing, hyperventilation, locus ceruleus, uh, activation of your fight or flight response, PAG, periaqueal gray. You want to avoid it. They don't want to go there because it's scary for them. Hippocampus, all right? I remember that when I was in fifth grade, this kid shoved me. So now whenever I see kids that remind me of him, I get very scared. And that tells me amygdala to activate my locus ceruleus, okay? Orbital frontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex has to do with affect. So if someone's showing the affect of, of, of fear and you see it in their face, that's that part of the brain, which is actually in the frontal lobe of your brain that's being activated. Any questions? Is that clear? All right. Know this chart, okay? Understand the half-lives of the medications. Everyone knows Xanax, right? Everyone's at, Xanax is popular because it's a very short half-life. Um, it works quickly. The onset is very quick, but it doesn't last that long. It's also very abusable, okay? And the reason why is because of the onset is very quick, and also the half-life is very short, so people can abuse it. And it's also very high potency, okay? Um, know that, you know, Librium obviously has a, a pretty long half-life. That's why we use it a lot in detox, okay? Any questions with that? It's pretty self-explanatory. So um, we use a lot of lorazepam. I use a lot of Ativan. So just for your information, in kids, we tend to use Ativan if we need to. It's the most studied in children. Plus, it has no active metabolites. We also use Ativan for catatonia. All right? If you've ever seen a patient who's catatonic, first-line treatment would be the Ativan challenge, lorazepam challenge. All right? If Ativan doesn't work, we'd probably use ECT. Any questions? Oxazepam is actually the least um, abusable drug, believe it or not. And I want you guys to look at that chart. Why is that? Why is oxazepam the least, or Cerax is the trade name, the least abusable drug? What is it about it? Low, low potency. Okay, that's that's one. Okay, low potency just means you need to high need to use a higher dose though. So someone can use oxazepam okay, so thirty more. Okay, all right. It takes three hours to yeah. work. Exactly, onset. That's the, the onset is important, right? If someone takes it, it's going to take three hours. So it's not like it's not like Xanax, which will kick in in an hour. So the fact that the onset is so slow. So people sometimes confuse. Usually we do believe the half-life. Like look at Paxil, Paroxine, short half-life, right? It, it kicks in faster, but it also has more withdrawal symptoms. With benzos, it's actually 
lipid solubility that makes a big difference. So the meds that work faster, like Xanax and Clonopin and Ativan, relatively, they're more lipid soluble. And our brain is what a bi uh, a bi biphosphate lipid bilayer, right? So anything that's lipid can cross faster, it works faster. So anything that crosses lipids faster will work faster. And also in theory can, you know, die down your anxiety, get it down faster, and also has higher abuse potential, all right? I typically, if I have to, I use clonopin. I don't use Xanax with patients, um, unless it's like they're going on a flight and I'll give them two Xanaxes, one, one Xanax for the flight there and one Xanax in the flight mode, that's it. Okay, side effects of treatment. So these are the meds that we use a lot for anxiety. We're just talking about anxiety disorders now, all right? I didn't put a slide for GAD, uh, social anxiety, because you guys can look that up yourself, but just know the differences, all right? So social anxiety disorder obviously is due to being out in public, right? You feel like people are judging you. You don't leave your house because you feel like when you're out in crowds, you get very nervous. Sometimes you might even have panic attacks. Generalized anxiety is a general feeling of uneasiness, right? It does. It's not related to being in crowds. They could be home alone and they'll just feel very tense, all right? Um, usually they'll have you know, they'll be worrying, they might have muscle tension, uh, they might fatigue very easily, they have issues with sleep, um, they might have issues with cognition. So the symptoms of MDD and GAD are very similar. The only difference is the core symptoms are very different, right? The core symptoms of MDD obviously is anhedonia, they don't feel pleasure, or low mood, right? They feel depressed. For GAD, it's worry and uh, fear, right? Or anxiety but they're still gonna have issues with fatigue. They still have issues with concentration. They still have issues with insomnia. See how those symptoms kind of overlap? And a lot of times people who do have MDD, they have comorbid anxiety, right? And sometimes that comorbid anxiety actually makes it a little bit harder to treat. So you would think, okay, SSRI treats anxiety and treats MDD, right? So you give them one med. In, in, in an ideal world, you would think I can get them better on both meds, but that's not really in clinical practice. It doesn't work out that way. And if you look at the STAR-D trials, people who have comorbid anxiety, they didn't, they didn't remit as fast. Well, they took longer to, to get better, all right? So you're going to see that also in clinical practice. So if you don't treat the comorbid anxiety and just treat the MDD, it's not going to get better. So you can either do um, a benzo short term in the very beginning, right? Because SSRIs can be stimulating in the beginning. And, you know, if you don't have a history of substance abuse or any family history of substance abuse, it might be safe for them to be on, on maybe, you know, short term benzos. And usually I'll do a month. And then each month, so maybe for the first month, I'll give them a 30-day supply, all right? Assuming that they don't have a drug use history and they're not abusing anything else. During that second month, I'll say, okay, now I'm only going to give you 15 because I don't want you to use that benzo every day, all right? Use it maybe every other day. And then the third month, I'm only giving them like two weeks or a week supply. They have to divide it up. But I don't keep them on it for three months, okay? Because around that time, I expect SSRI to kick in already, okay? Alpha-2, Delta-1 ligands, that would be your gabapentin and your Lyrica. I'm just bringing it up, but it, it's off-label, okay? But we do use that a lot in clinical practice. So gabapentin is obviously not FDA-approved for, for um, GAD, but it's used a lot. Lyrica, surprisingly enough, is actually FDA-approved in Europe, and they use it a lot for GAD, but we don't use it here. But they have the very, they have the very same mechanism, Alpha-2, Delta-1 ligand, all right? But it's interesting. Lyrica is controlled, but gabapentin is not. But now... I think eventually it's going to move towards being controlled because a lot of people, um, they abuse it also, all right? Especially in uh, forensic settings. You'll see patients on like 2,000 milligrams of gabapentin, right? They sniff it, they use it together with opioids and it gives it a synergistic effect. It kind of amplifies their high, okay? We'll talk about that more when we get to substance abuse in uh, week five, I believe. Benzodiazepines, obviously sedation is a big factor. So make sure that you monitor them and, and warn them not to combine them with alcohol. Risk for falls with patients who are older, obviously. Retrograde amnesia, all right? So it's going to affect memory, which is why we don't really give benzo. Someone who, P, who has PTSD, um, we try not to give them benzodiazepines because they're, they're going to have a hard time processing their trauma, all right? So you actually want them to be alert and oriented. And if you're giving them Xanax or any other benzo, it kind of defeats the purpose, all right? Confusion. And obviously the risk of tolerance, which they have to go higher and dependence. It's hard for them to get off, okay? Anticholinergics would be like your Atarax or hydroxyzine, okay? We also use that for um, anxiety. And sometimes I'll use that 
instead of benzodiazepines, if someone needs like a PRN, anti-anxiety medication in the beginning while they're getting their SSRI on board, okay? So usually I'll prescribe hydroxyzine 50 milligrams. Just be aware, what does, what does hydroxyzine do? What can it do to someone, especially if you go high doses? What is it? What is it? What is uh, the danger of hydroxyzine? Is it the exper uh, experimental? I think it's like dehydration. No, it actually affects your heart. It prolongs QTC. All mm -hmm. right. So actually, in Europe, with children, they don't they 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 recommend don't go 100 milligrams. But it's funny. I work in child psych and I work in adult psych, but. When I was covering an RTF, a resident treatment facility, we had a lot of kids on there that were on hydroxyzine, like 50 milligrams every four hours. And they were on cogentin one milligram twice a day, and they were on olanzapine. So how much anticholinergic is that, right? Anticholinergic of the hydroxyzine, um, antihistamine and anticholinergic. You have the um, olanzapine, which is obviously very anticholinergic, and you have the cogentin. And then the parent is saying, my kid can't focus, they have ADHD. Right, and then the doctor puts them on Adderall. <laughs> Does that make any sense? No, that's that's polypharmacy 101. All right. So before you put someone on a medication, you should wonder: Are those effects, quote unquote, they're having the you know the uh, the issues with focus? Is it because they're on too much anticholinergic meds? All right. You you need acetylcholine in your brain in order to to function. Right. To have that's why um, Alzheimer's people can't focus because they they have you know they have issues with anti with uh, acetylcholine. So you're pretty much giving them Alzheimer's chemically with, with meds, and then you're saying they have ADHD. Makes no sense, all right? So before you put patients on stimulants, make sure that you check. And the beers criteria is very important. You look at that. Obviously, we use that more for geriatrics and older patients, but you know, anticholinergic med affects everyone of all ages, right? You take enough Benadryl, you take enough Cogentin, you're going to have a hard time focusing too, okay? So anticholinergic burden is very bad. In, in psychiatry, it happens a lot and we should really work our best to, to reduce it. But remember, you can't just cut anticholinergic meds quickly. You have to taper them off, right? Because of what? Your receptors are, what? From all that blockade, upregulated, right? So you can't just stop it or else they're gonna have withdrawal symptoms, which is really bad. It could be, you know, it could be flu-like symptoms, um, it could be diarrhea, right? What's opposite of, it could be salivation because all those receptors are, are free now and you're going to have the opposite, right? Someone could have diarrhea. They can have flu-like symptoms. They could be agitated. They could be more aggressive. So you really need to reduce it, okay? We're going to talk about that with antipsychotics. When you're, when you're stopping olanzapine or switching someone from olanzapine to another antipsychotic medication, you can't just stop the olanzapine cold turkey. You have to taper them off, all right? Questions with this slide? Anything not clear? Okay, antipsychotics. Everyone knows that the antipsychotic effect is D2 antagonism, mostly, all right? We've had D2 antagonists since 1952. The first uh, antipsychotic was chlorpromazine. Shortly after that, we had clozapine, all right? Clozapine was out on the market for a little bit, then they pulled it out because when it, was, when it was released, they found that the patient suffered from what? What did it do? And then they pulled it off the market. I think it was the extra pyramidal symptoms. Or oh. um, tardive, 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 and that's going to shut down your immune system. And obviously, you can cause death, right? Because you're going to die from secondary infections. Um, that happened with clozapine, and they pulled it off the market. But when they put it back in the market, they realized the importance of the medication. It was one of the few meds that actually helps people who have something called treatment-resistant schizophrenia. Anyone want to try to chime in? What does treatment-resistant schizophrenia mean? Isn't it like if you've had like two trials of like monotherapy, and like they both didn't work, they usually right. put you on clozapine, right? Correct, yeah. The key word is ad adequate dose, adequate level, adequate duration. People forget that sometimes, all right? I specialize in schizophrenia, so I'm very particular when it comes to treatment schizophrenia, with treating schizophrenia because we don't really have many tools and, and I really see a lot of schizophrenia patients all the time. So sometimes people will be in clozapine and they didn't need to be in clozapine, right? They would have responded just as good in, in any other antipsychotic. And now you have someone who's put on 120 pounds, 
on closing bid, right? You want to reserve the big guns for people who really need it. So sometimes people will be unmet. They'll say it's a failure, but there's no plasma drug levels, right? You go into history and you find out that the patient, you know, was non-compliant. So how do you really rule out? You don't want to put patients on clozapine prematurely. Look, I love clozapine. I prescribe it a lot, but I don't want someone to be on clozapine unless they really need to be on clozapine, all right? Because they might respond just as well on any other antipsychotic medication. And then what happens when they fail clozapine? They're at the end of the road. They might be ultra resistant and they might not respond to any more antipsychotics. So you really want to reserve clozapine for people who are treatment resistant, all right? That's a pet peeve of mine. Um, so make sure that when you put someone on an antipsychotic medication, you're making sure that they're taking it. And the only way you really know they're taking it is if you do plasma drug levels, all right? Do a plasma drug level. Um, if someone's taking a med and there's no effect, but there's also no side effects, you should be, you should wonder, are they really taking the medication? And that's why you would do a plasma drug level, okay? Uh, what is the difference between a typical first generation and atypical antipsychotic? Anyone want to chime in? First generation, second generation. Yeah. What is first generation notorious for? Uh, EPS, EPS. Yes. EPS symptoms and prolactin. Very good. Okay. Yes. I don't like to use the term extrapyramidal symptoms anymore. I know it's in the book, but it's, it's a nonsense term because it's not very specific. And whenever I get patients from other prescribers and they write, uh, we had to stop medication because of EPS. Which EPS? Is it tardive dyskinesia? Is it acute dystonia? Is it akathisia? Is it elevated prolactin? I don't know, right? It's good to know that stuff. And sometimes people are lazy to just write EPS, but really best practice to be very specific. You can write, we had to stop the med because of EPS, but then in maybe in parentheses, right? Patient was stiff, right? Eyes rolling up, staring up into the air, ocular gyro crisis, right? Patient took medication, could not sit still, had akathisia. So instead of writing EPS, it would really help the next practitioner if you actually wrote what the side effect was, okay? So EPS, just so you know, is an umbrella term that's not very specific, but encompasses all of the movements that are outside of the pyramidal neurons. That's what we call extra pyramidal symptoms. And it will be dystonia. Acute dystonia would be uh, involuntary muscle contraction or muscle spasms, all right? Dyskinesia is involuntary muscle movements. So people might have involuntary movements, right? Usually they're rhythmic. So their shoulders might move back like this, right? Rhythmic movements. Um, and usually that could be indicative if it's later on of tardive dyskinesia, all right? Um, acute dystonia usually happens first. Akathisia happens usually a couple of days after that. And obviously dyskinesia and tardive dyskinesia are a little bit later on. Tardive dyskinesia, we'll talk about the pathophysiology of it in a little bit, but it also can happen if someone prematurely stops their meds quickly. You can have rebound tardive dyskinesia also, all right? So we usually tell patients, do not stop your meds cold turkey, especially first generation of because you're going to have upregulation of those receptors in the nigrostriatal area. And what's going to happen? You have very sensitive and upregulated um, receptors in the nigrostriatal area. And now when you stop the med, you're going to have all that extra dopamine binding into that. And that's going to cause all that spastic and frequent movements of tardive dyskinesia, all right? 5-HT2A antagonism, all right? That usually works on the GABA interneuron. And what that's going to do is going to tell the GABA interneuron to release GABA and quiet down uh, the glutamate, which is what? Going to increase dopamine in the digostriatal area and increase dopamine in the mesocortical area. I know there's a bunch of like negatives, positive negatives. You don't have to remember all of that. If you can just remember for now, 5-HT2A antagonism, increase dopamine in the frontal lobe and in the digostriatal area. That's enough, all right? So any med that has a 5-HT2A antagonism property can be effective with negative symptoms, possibly, and combat against EPS. Is that clear? And usually atypical or second generations are going to have both those mechanisms. It's not only going to be a D2 antagonist, but it's also going to be a 5-HT2A antagonist or also a 5-HT1A agonist or partial agonist. Remember, 5-HT1A is the, <clears throat> is the mirror image of 5-HT2A. You do the opposite. 5 h 2 a is a dopamine break. And when you cut the breaks, right, increase, increase the dopamine secretion. 5 h 2 a excuse me, is the accelerator. So when you innervate it, it's an increased dopamine. Same thing. Is that clear? Can you just repeat that one with the 2A and the 1A? That was confusing. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. 5 h 2 a when you block it, it's going to increase dopamine. Okay. 5 h 2 a when you stimulate it, with a partial agonist or a full agonist, it's gonna increase dopamine. Okay, thank you. And so they're like opposite of each other. And also it's ironic because we have meds that do both of them at the same time, right? And the meds that do both of them at the same time, EPS risk is actually almost zero or very low, 
And I'll give you an example, quetiapine. Quetiapine's EPS risk is very, very low. I've never seen anyone have EPS in quetiapine, right? And clozapine at the same time. And ironically, they're both very strong 5-HT2A antagonists and 5-HT1A partial agonists. But can I ask you one other question? So if, if the 5-HT2A um, antagonist increases dopamine, what would, would a 5-HT1A antagonist, not agonist, what would that do to dopamine? If we don't have 5-HT1A antagonist. Okay, second. thank you. <laughs> In theory, yes, if we made one, yes, it would do it. We don't have any antagonist. Okay, thank you. That was confusing. Yeah. I have a question, Professor. Um, so going back to the T D2 antagonist, um, I was trying to understand how um, I remember uh, we spoke about D2 being uh, inhibitory. And when you give an agonist, uh, antagonist, it will basically inhibit. Yeah. So I kind of don't understand. How okay. When, when they mentioned that, there's D1 and D5-like receptors, right? Which are stimulating or excitatory. And you have D2, D3, D4, which are inhibitory. Think of that at the postsynaptic neuron as being inhibitory intracellularly, all right? So it's not like GABA, which is inhibitory in which you secrete a GABA uh, neuron and it shuts down the activity of that neurotransmitter. Or you give someone glutamate, which is excitatory, right? And that's more external. I think you're confusing with excitatory and inhibitory with with how we describe GABA and glutamate, right? Okay. It actually, it's different. It works intracellularly. And for me to describe, I think I'm gonna confuse everyone else for now, but that's a high level conversation that if you make it to the clinical site, we're gonna go into it in detail. I'll explain it to you, all right? Because right now it's like the course is so, but just don't, they're, they're not the same, all right? When, when they say that the D, D1, D5 are stimulatory or excitatory, it's not the same as glutamate. I understand, okay. So, so yeah, it's, it's just intracellular, it has to do with the cascade, and uh, cycling A, cycling A and P formation. All, all right? we need to know is that the D two antagonists they decrease dopamine in um, in all the pathways of dopamine, even the ones that we don't want to decrease. That's all. We yeah, need correct. To yeah, know. yeah, correct. Yes, for now, for now. Yeah. But th those are great questions. You guys are asking me very great questions, which are very deep, and I wish I could answer them now. But the class is only six weeks long, so it's going to be hard to go into biochemistry and, and be too detailed with it. But if you guys do clinicals with me and you guys are in 517 or 527, whatever next, when you guys go to clinicals, we'll talk about that. All right. I just had one quick, like, just to clarify, because I thought that the 5-HT1A was inhibitory. And the I know that the 5-HT2A is excitatory. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. But it's on a GABA neuron. So if you inhibit a GABA neuron in a way you excite it, it becomes excitatory. So it's a net effect, which is why sometimes... If you get too much in the weeds, it's going to get too confusing for you for now. So if you just take my advice and trust the process, right? If 5-HT1A, a medicine that is a partial agonist or an agonist for now, just remember in your mind without understanding all the little pieces, because it's going to be too confusing for now, will increase dopamine. All right. So that's why there's less EPS. A 5-HT2A antagonist would be what? A dope, cutting the brakes, increasing dopamine. You're right. 5-HT1A is that, but that's on a GABA neuron, which is negative. So it disinhibits inhibition, which is confusing if you really look at it that way. But if you remember it this way, just blood strokes for now, it'll make sense. Oh, it's like a double negative. Yeah, it's a double negative. Yeah. So so um, the 5-HT2A antagonist, when when you, it's because it's on a GABA. Interneuron. Uh, because it, right. because it, it's on a GABA um, a neuron. So once you give the antagonist, then it will release glutamate and that actually activates, uh, releases dopamine. That's that's the pathway? Correct, yes, correct. Right. So both the 5-HT1A agonist or partial agonist and 5-HT2A antagonist, they both increase dopamine. Correct, they do the same thing, exactly, yeah. Just know the net effect for now, because like I said, it's a six week course and we can always fill in details later on. So like this is an introductory course. So I, my job here is to kind of get you guys to know the broad strokes of things. And as you get to clinicals, we really fill in those details. All right. You Professor, you had mentioned earlier that they do the opposite. So it's basically it one is the opposite. Is yeah. and one is stimulating. That's the opposite that you're talking about. But both in, in the final will just increase dopamine. They're opposite in that if you both agonize both of them, right? If I give someone a 5 hc 2 a agonist, it's going to decrease dopamine. If I give someone a 5-HT1A agonist, it's going to increase dopamine. That's what I mean that they're opposite. But if I give someone a 5-HT2A antagonist, it's going to increase dopamine. 
If I give someone a 5-HT1A agonist, it's increased dopamine. Does that make sense? You may say it again. No, I'm still confused. A agonist increases dopamine. 5-HT1A agonist increases dopamine. Is it clear? Just say that one more time. Sure. 5-HT2A antagonist blockade increases dopamine. 5-HT1A agonist increases dopamine. Um, hi, Professor. Yes. Um, sorry. Um, okay, so the dopamine, maybe it's a dumb question, but I got confused now. Okay, okay so if the dopamine uh, goes up, in this particular case, for example, in a 5H2A antagonist, mm -hmm. uh, most of the antipsychotics actually do that. So it's beneficial because it works in what area? The meso, not, not the best. Mesocortical, meso right? Which is yeah. so increases there. Mm -hmm. And that helps with, uh, with negative symptoms of schizophrenia. It's supposed to, yeah, in theory, but not right. always. Not always, but okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know this is, I only put four, <laughs> four things there, but it's a very complicated slide. So we'll, we'll all keep repeating it again. All right. And I would say a D2 partial agonist, like I mentioned, like aripiprazole, rexpiprazole, and coriprazine, Vralar are, are stabilizers. So if someone has schizophrenia and you're giving them a D2 partial agonist, you're not giving them a D2 partial agonist to increase dopamine, right? You're giving them a D2 partial agonist to actually decrease dopamine because the partial agonist is going to compete at the D2 receptors with the actual neurotransmitter, and it's going to work as a net antagonist, right? That's the way it works. So I don't know why they named it a partial agonist. They should have named it a partial antagonist. But I guess it makes sense because it's schizophrenia, it would work as a partial antagonist, right? Because you want to decrease dopamine in the psychotic part. But in mood disorders, you want it to work more as a partial agonist. But just know it works both ways. It'll agonize when it needs to, and it'll block when it needs to block, okay? Extra pramosomes, like I said, is more common with first generation. That doesn't mean that you can't get it with second generation either, right? Just so you guys know, risperidone, after two milligrams, it actually turns into a first generation antipsychotic. So if you really want to give risperidone as an atypical or second generation, you probably should keep it below two milligrams, which a lot of people don't do, right? You see people are very sick, they're on risperidone four, risperidone five. That's equivalent to almost the same amount as Haldol. Right, it, it loses a lot of its its um, atypicality once you go up in dose, and some meds are like that, kind of like Seroquel. Depending on the dose, it becomes a very different medication, right? Like Abilify two and five milligrams, we use that as an adjunct for depression, but once you go above five, its D two blockade gets a little bit stronger, and it becomes more antipsychotic effect, right? So that's why we don't use it at that dose for people with depression. If someone has psychosis, we're going to go much higher, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, even thirty. Okay, metabolic burden. Is the That's same the true for paliperidone that it loses its, it becomes basically a first generation after a certain dose level? Correct. Yes, correct. Yes. What is that dose level offhand? You know, uh, I don't remember the equivalency because I don't use paliperidone PO that much, but um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it does because it's the same. It's the active metabolite of risperidone, so it'll be the same. It might just be a little bit different, maybe a, a few, uh, a few milligrams, if even, all right. Um, okay, metabolic burden. So make sure that patients who are on atypicals, make sure that you monitor what? Fasting blood glucose, right? Make sure you do an A1C if you need to. Make sure you do um, waist circumference. You wanna check the waist circumference. You also wanna do the blood pressure and you wanna do lipid panel, okay? Exopramal signal, once again, like I mentioned. Um, pseudo, so there's Parkinson, Parkinsonism also, right? That can happen because you're blocking dopamine in the nigrostriatal area. So they might have shuffling gait. They might lose their balance. They might have tremors, okay? They might have bradykinesia, very slow movements, okay? Sometimes you'll see their face. It's almost like they're wearing a mask. You don't see any reaction. And sometimes we confuse that for negative symptoms. So sometimes there's something called drug-induced drug negative symptoms, all right? In which someone's on a very strong D2 blocker and they become almost like a, like, a, like a robot, the way they move and they have no facial reactions. That's not the schizophrenia, that's actually the medication. So we might have to either lower the dose or switch them to an atypical because we need a little bit more 5-ET2A in the mesocortical area 
or you need a little bit, I'm sorry, a little more dopamine in the mesocortical areas, so you need a 5 g 2 a antagonist. You need a little bit more dopamine in the nigrostriatal areas, so you need a 5 g 2 a antagonist, right? Does that make sense? Acute dystonia, again, you know, that's, that's um, muscle spasms. The most dangerous one is actually laryngeal spasm. People can choke on that. I've seen that uh, in the hospital too, right? That's a medical emergency. So you ask patients, are you choking on your food? Once they start choking on their food, you need to put them on anticholinergic medication, all right? Or switch the medication. Okay. Akathisia, feeling restless. They can't sit still. During the interview, you see them pacing up and down. Usually what I'll do is I'll say, okay, can you, I want to do a test. Can you just sit in the chair for 60 seconds and not move? And then I'll just sit and stare at them and see how they, how they are. People have akathisia, they can't do it. Maybe 20 seconds, they'll start moving around. They'll start twitching, they'll start moving their butt. They can't stay in the chair. They'll say, hey, I'm sorry, can I, can I walk around? Because I feel real uncomfortable right now. That's akathisia, all right? It's an inner feeling of restlessness. Not only is it motor, but it's also sensory. So if someone just has motor, they're just moving around, but they don't have an inner feeling of restlessness, it might be something else, okay? Well, can I ask you a quick question? Yes. With these, with these side effects, you know, like, uh, is it just the, the, the greater good? So if the, depending on, on, you know, how bad the patient was in their symptoms and then how many side effects they have and what they're, they are like, besides the laryngo or anything life-threatening, is it sort of just, you know, which risk benefit whole picture if they're better? Is that a clinical decision? It is risk benefit. But the thing is, if someone develops EPS or acute dystonia early on in treatment, especially like early on with their, their first diagnosis, schizophrenia or psychosis, that's not a good sign because that means they're at higher risk of developing tardive dyskinesia as an adult. Okay, so that just gets worse. Okay. Yeah, so it's probably better, you know, ethically too, to, to get the patient on a med because there's so many different types of meds and the affinities are all very different that I'm, very, I'm almost positive someone is responsible for D2 blockade for their psychosis that you can find a medication that's there that will fit them appropriately and not give them really bad side effects and okay. still control their psychosis, all right? Okay. Ideally, that's what you want, Okay. But if someone's been in, in and out of the state, because I worked in the state hospital also in the past, and someone's you know been in the state hospital in and out, and they've been on every medication, and they're aggressive, and they're suicidal when they're psychotic, then yes. Then you might have to deal with it and just kind of manage those side effects and keep the dose the same. Right? Right. There's always going to be a balance with tolerability and efficacy. Right? And some patients, they'll take a med that has very bad tolerability if it's effective. They'll say, you know what, I've been psychotic, and I can't hold the job. I want a relationship. I don't care about this occasional, you know, stiffness in my arm. I'll just take my cogentin in the morning. It's okay. So you kind of have to do shared decision making and talk to the patient about it. Yeah. Metabolic syndrome. Okay. The way I remember this is FATS. P H A T S. If you don't want to remember this this chart, you can just remember the acronym FATS. P stands for blood pressure. All right. So elevated blood pressure, obviously. H stands for HDL, so HDL is going to be low. That's a good cholesterol, okay? And uh, A stands for adiposity or abdominal, so obviously waist circumference. T stands for triglycerides, which are going to be elevated, and S stands for sugar, okay? So that's the acronym if you want to remember it without memorizing this chart. FATS, P-H-A-T-S. P for blood pressure, H for HDL is going to be low. A is going to be for abdomen or adipose tissue. T is going to be for triglycerides, and S is going to be for sugar very self-explanatory. And highest risk for these are people who have, uh, are on atypical antipsychotics, right? Some of, you know, the sad part is a lot of our most effective medications, like olanzapine, I love olanzapine, it's one of our most effective medications, has a very high metabolic burden. So, you know, you, you might stabilize someone on it, but then, you know, they put on like 20 pounds, 30 pounds, only being on it for one month. Now, what do you do, right? You put them on, on a treatment that works, but so what I usually do is I start metformin prophylactically. So I'll start 500 milligrams of metformin, and I'll do that for about a month. Then I'll do uh, then I'll do a thousand milligrams for a month, and I'll push it up all the way to two thousand milligrams. All right. How much weight do people gain? Like if you oh, get the metformin on there, thirty pounds. Someone gained in like three months on the landscape. But me, like for you, you noticed that people started. You start on metformin, only gain like half of that, or none you know, at all. They're still going to gain weight a little bit, but it's not going to be as much as if as if they weren't on the metformin. All right. Okay. So it, it's really, it's for, it's for prevention than more it is for losing weight, right? Mm -hmm. I tell patients, look, I know you're not diabetic. I'll give them the whole education. You don't have type two diabetes, but you know, metformin is the most studied medication to help prevent metabolic syndrome. I'll show them all the studies if mm -hmm. you want to. And really it's, it's the best one. You know, I've, I've had, um, 
pediatricians argue with me. I've had PCPs argue with me, and I show them the data. They say, "Oh, why? Why are you putting my, the patient on metformin?" And you know, it's their lack of education on this and antipsychotic meds, right? So I have to educate them, and I'll show them. Look, they're on a medicine that's that's very, you know, metabolically unstable for them, and this is the only way we can stop them from gaining weight. And some of them need education. They'll say, "Well, we'll tell the patients just eat healthy and and go on a good diet." It's not enough. Trust me, it's not enough. Mm-hmm. And Professor, it's not dose dependent either. Not dose dependent. Olanzapine, two milligrams, five milligrams can do the same thing. Questions? Uh, Professor, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you just repeat that acronym again, please? FATS. P H A T S. P is for pressure. H is for HDLs. A is for adiposity. T is for triglycerides. And S is for sugar. Thank you. And these are the four dopamine pathways, all right? Um, question, um, yes. how, how will uh, exercise and diet really affect the metabolic syndrome uh, in the atypical antipsychotics alone, like without- uh, The effect size is very low, very low. That's why a lot of the guidelines that I recommend prophylactic metformin, right? Because we, because we appreciate that, how much it can happen. Okay. So, so I, I mean, you want them, to, of course, you still want them to exercise and, and, and eat healthy, but that alone is not going to be enough. And you want to be honest with me, because the thing is, if you don't tell a patient that, right, and they believe that they can just fight it off with exercise and diet, and they start gaining weight, their self-esteem is going to go down. They're going to think it's a failure on their part. So you need to tell them right away, look, it's the 5 hc well, I mean, if they want to know, it's the 5 hc 2 c antagonism that's messing with the ghrelin and leptin in your hypothalamus, right? That's causing you to eat more and not feel full, right? It's the antihistamine that's also messing with your metabolism that's causing you to gain weight. So unfortunately, you can't override that with just healthy foods and, and diet. So it's parts in the brain that that's unfortunately. So there is a there is a lanzapine formulation not called Lybalvi. I'm sure you guys have seen commercials about it. So it's L Y B A L V I, which is just um, a lanzapine with uh, semidorphin, which is a mu opioid antagonist. So what that does is it it kind of messes with your reward pathway because what does naltrexone do? Right, you eat and you feel pleasure. It stimulates your reward pathway, and that opioid rush is going to stimulate dopamine release and eventually mental area and make you feel good. So by giving them an opioid antagonist like semidorphin, right? It blocks the mu opioid kappa and delta receptors. When they eat, they're not going to feel that pleasure. So in theory, it's, it's going to kind of curb their eating. But I still think that you probably should still put them with metformin just in case on top of the live algae. I haven't used live algae that many, that many times because I hate doing pre-authorizations. And I've had good... The thing is, a lot of my patients that are on the lanzapine, they're on high dose of lanzapine, like 30 milligrams or even 40 milligrams of lanzapine. That the Libalvi, there's no equivalent because it maxes out at 20 milligrams of olanzapine. And I can't get the insurance companies to pay for a higher dose. So I just stay with olanzapine, regular, generic, right? Any questions? I, so I just, again, um, yes. so the, when you're going up in the metformin, is it because the person is still gaining weight or is it because of kind of like the, um, the downstream effect of, you know, the medication or? Well, the thing is, most of the studies that have shown that metformin is alleviated weight gain have been in the 1,500 to 2,000 milligram range. So a lot of times practitioners will keep them at 500 and 1,000 milligrams of metformin because they're, they're uncomfortable pushing it up. But the thing is, that's not really evidence-based because if you want to follow guidelines and see what has shown to actually reduce the weight gain, you're better off just putting them on the 1,500 or 2,000 milligrams if the patient can tolerate it, right? The reason why we're doing a very slow titration is because the GI side effects are really bad. And the last thing you want is to put a patient on a thousand milligrams, they get diarrhea, nausea, and they say, you know what, I don't want this. So I'd rather go very slow and just titrate up and make sure they stay on it. Okay. If the insurance, if the insurance will pay for metformin ER, that's said to be more tolerable. So if you can get ER approved by insurance, I would do that too. Any questions? So there's no mesolimbic that's positive symptoms. Yes. Could you give Ozempic? You know, there's studies now showing that it's effective in mood disorders, but it, it's very short supply and it's very expensive. So I don't know if pre-authorizations would even approve it at this point. Okay. They're doing a lot of studies with it in, in uh, patients who have metabolic syndrome and mood disorders. And it actually shows these improvements in cognition also. But at this point, it's not ready yet to be approved. I don't think insurances would approve it. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. But I guess if your last name is Kardashian, you'd be able to have no problem getting it, right? <laughs> right. All right. So this was very like short and brief because I don't want to overwhelm you guys with like stuff. 
But just understand that for treatment of schizophrenia, you need to have dopamine blockade, all right? I'm not gonna ask questions about specific medications, like what the difference is risperidone and olanzapine, but just know what are the regular first generation. That would be Haldol, Copromazine, that would be first generation, Prolixin, those are the three most common. No, second generation would be Aripiprazole, Olanzapine, Risperidone, all right? Latuda, those are just some common second generation. Know that for second generations, it causes a lot of metabolic side effects. So make sure that you monitor for, for that, right? You do psychoeducation on healthy diet and exercise on top of possibly starting metformin on top of that also, okay? Um, first generation, make sure you go very slow. And if you have to, uh, if they're having EPS, what do we prescribe usually? Anticholinergic. Very good. Why is that? How does anticholinergic work with movement disorders? Going to increase the dopamine. Okay. So if um, I give someone anticholinergic, you're going to increase the dopamine? How? They need more um, acetylcholine. Yes. Okay. So in the very good. The nigrostriol area, there's an inverse relationship between acetylcholine and dopamine, right? So when you give someone a dopamine blocker, when you block the dopamine receptors, it's actually going to increase the amount of acetylcholine. So you're going to have too much overabundance of acetylcholine, and that's going to cause a lot of the EPS symptoms, right? There's, if you realize there's a lot of interactions between all the neurotransmitters, acetylcholine will act on dopamine and cause these issues. Dopamine will act on acetylcholine, and dopamine will also act on serotonin. They all kind of interlap in a way. So just understanding that the too much acetylcholine is gonna, is gonna cause spasticity and involuntary muscle movements in the nigrostriol area. So what you're doing is to counteract that, you can give them anticholinergic medication, which blocks that, all right? I wish we had more time because I can talk about schizophrenia for like weeks. I could do the whole six week course on just schizophrenia, but understand that long-term dopamine blockade in nigrostriol area will predispose someone to something called tardive dyskinesia, all right? Tardive dyskinesia is actually, um, a movement disorder, which happens because when you're blocking dopamine in the nigrostriol area, you're gonna have what? Upregulation of dopamine receptors. So in reality, um, tardive dyskinesia is actually um, the pathophysiology that there's too much dopamine stimulation in the nigrostriol area. Does that make sense? I'm gonna say it again. In the beginning, when someone has EPS, there's not enough dopamine. So it's gonna cause bradykinesia and it's gonna cause EPS, right? Or dystonia. After a while, when you block these receptors too much, your receptors in nigrostriol they're going to upregulate because there's all that dopamine is going to be blocked. So they're going to be upregulated and they're also going to be very sensitive. So what's going to happen is now the upregulation and the extra sensitivity of those dopamine receptors are going to be so sensitive that when dopamine actually touches it, it's going to be worse. You're going to have involuntary movements and you're going to have you know all these strange movements all over your body, not just in the face. Also, your trunk can have uh, tardive dyskinesia, uh, your arms, your shoulders. Also your mouth, obviously. Um, so just know that when patients stop their meds, that's what we have withdrawal, tardive dyskinesia, right? Because you know that those receptors are upregulated and they're very sensitive. Now someone stops their dopamine blocker, let's say Haldol. Now all that dopamine is actually gonna flush. It's gonna go into the receptors and it's gonna bind to all those unblocked receptors. And it's gonna bind to all those new receptors and tardive is gonna get worse. The worst thing to do actually, if someone has tardive dyskinesia is to stop the medicine cold turkey. What you need to do is slowly taper them off and give a chance for the receptors to accommodate, right? And go back, downregulate again. And we give them some, something called a vesicular monoamine transport inhibitor, a VMAT inhibitor, right? And the reason why is because I said, when your neurotransmitters are being recycled, remember, it's too much dopamine, right? So what you want to do is you want to kill off some of that dopamine excess. And how you kill that off is by not allowing the dopamine to go back inside the vesicle. Because remember, unless you're in the vesicle, you're not safe, right? Because if you're not inside the vesicle, you have you have a uh, monoamine oxidase, which is inside the, the neuron that's eating up any excess dopamine. So by blocking the vesicular monoamine transport, it's gonna not let uh, dopamine in, it's gonna reverse it actually. And then dopamine is gonna get eaten up and in, in the downstream effects, they're gonna have less dopamine release in the nigrostriol area, right? So if you think about that, and I'm gonna repeat it again until you guys understand it, VMAT can actually worsen EPS because in a way, if you give someone a VMAT inhibitor and you're decreasing dopamine there, eventually they can have EPS. So if you look at the, the, the label on VMAT inhibitors, it can cause EPS symptoms, right? And if someone has tardive dyskinesia and you give them cogentin by increasing dopamine, it actually worsens um, tardive dyskinesia. You see the dilemma we're in now? And someone can have both. They can have tardive dyskinesia and they can have EPS. I'm, I'm just gonna let, let that simmer for a second, let you guys think about it. <laughs> it's confusing. 
But if you think about it, it makes sense. You need me to repeat it again. Yeah, can you repeat that again, please? Sure, okay. So someone is psychotic, right? And I want to give them Haldol. And they're psychotic because they have hyperactive dopamine in the mesolimbic area. So I'm going to give them Haldol 5 milligrams, all right? They're no longer psychotic, but the Haldol 5 milligram is blocking about 80% of the dopamine receptors in the nigrostriatal area. That's the threshold for EPS, right? Now the patient is saying, oh my God, my, my, neck, my neck is stiff, all right? Uh, can you please help me out? I give them cogentin 1 milligram. Goes away, all right? Because that... That acetylcholine now is going to go back down because I'm giving them anticholinergic medication to block the excess acetylcholine by blocking those receptors, right? And it's going to increase dopamine there at the same time. Now, over time, they're saying, you know what? I feel better. I want to stop my, my medications. I'm, I, I'm tired of taking Haldol. They stop it. Now they're having involuntary muscle movements. And the reason why that's happening is because that long-term Haldol blockade has caused the dopamine receptors in the nigrostriatal area to what? Upregulate, right? And they become more sensitive. So now all that excess dopamine is going to bind to those excess receptors. The patient is going to have tired dyskinesia, right? Patient says, okay, all right, I want to restart my medication again. I put them back on the Haldol. Tired dyskinesia, sometimes it gets better, sometimes it doesn't. Now they have long-term tired dyskinesia. Unfortunately, it's permanent now at this point, right? I put them on a VMAT inhibitor. And the reason why is because there's still excess dopamine receptors and they're still very sensitive. So what I want to do is I want to kill off that dopamine that's in the nigrostriatal area that's binding to those upregulated and sensitive receptors. I give them a VMAT inhibitor, which stops the neurotransmitter dopamine of being reuptaken the vesicles inside of the neuron, right? Because whatever doesn't go inside the vesicle is going to get eaten up by monoamine oxidase, right? You have monoamine oxidase A and monoamine oxidase B, right? It gets eaten up. There's less dopamine now that's going to be inside that in that pathway. But what's going to happen? You're going to say, oh my God, now my neck is getting stiff again, right? Because I don't have enough dopamine there. So what happens? You actually, sometimes you have to, you have to choose. And for, that's the dilemma you have. What's worse for you? What bothers you more? The involuntary movements or the muscle stiffness? And it sucks. It's kind of like someone has Parkinsonism. What's worse for you? Not being able to move or the psychosis. And unfortunately, that's why these drugs need to be updated with different mechanisms because when you're just playing with dopamine, these are the dilemmas that we're going to get stuck in. Yes, Elliot, question. Yeah, I just had a quick question. I, I was reading in the book, it said that there's no medications available for tardive dyskinesia. And then in the other one, it said, I think it's like valbenazine uh, is used for Yes, valbenazine is a VMAT inhibitor. Which book says there's no treatment? It's probably outdated. Which book is that one? Um, the, I, I don't know, the, the psychopharmacology one, not the Stahl's book, the other one. The Enger one, the blue one? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm sorry. I think it's that one. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's wrong. <laughs> there is, <laughs> you have medications for VMAT inhibitors. All right. Yeah. There's a valbenazine, tetrabenazine, do tetrabenazine. They're all, they're all similar meds. They do the same thing. Remember the first VMAT inhibitor I mentioned it during my last lecture was what? Reserpine. Remember? That's what, that's what spun the, the, the hypotheses that not enough uh, neurotransmitters were causing depression. We gave someone reserpine. Which, uh, which is a irreversible VMAT inhibitor, which caused none of the neurotransmitters to go back into the, the vesicle, right? So it killed off all the serotonin, all the norepinephrine, all the dopamine. Person had controlled blood pressure, but they were also depressed. Does that make sense? The, yes. the VMAT inhibitors, the neural ones, are not irreversible. They're reversible. Is, is tardive dyskinesia something that you can... Um, like predict will happen or you, you really just don't know? You don't really know. But like I said, some of the red flags are that if someone has um, early EPS on D2 blockade, that's not a good sign. That means they might be a higher risk of tardive dyskinesia. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's the only thing. Right. But some people don't have any, will never get it. And it's been like 20 years and they've been- there are some people, like yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. We didn't talk about this in the first lecture, and I probably should have mentioned it more, but Stahl talks about a lot. It's called epigenetics, all right? The reason why sometimes we can't explain medications appropriately and patients ask us, oh, you, the med you gave me is supposed to do this, right? But it's doing this. is because of epigenetics, right? Adverse childhood experiences. You might have less serotonin transport pumps in your brain, and that's epigenetic. That's not changing your genes, but it's changing how it's expressed. So you might not have enough transport pumps. And that's why you're, you're predisposed to having less serotonin. You might be depressed, right? Or you might not have enough serotonin transport pumps and you might not respond to an SSRI. I might have to use a DNRI because you have more dopamine transport pumps. Get it? Everyone doesn't have the same amount of 
receptors in their brain. That all changes best based on your environment, right? Your interactions with people, what you eat, a lot of things. So that's why sometimes that's how we explain to patients why sometimes the meds might not work for you, right? And that's why you might have to change different mechanisms. Of course, we have all these hypotheses and we have all these proposed um, methods of making drugs and what we think they do. But in a way, it doesn't always work the same for all the patients because again, it's their depression might be due to something else, right? And our, our diagnosing system, which I'm going to talk about when you guys get to the clinical part, is broken. DSM is not the best way to diagnose people, right? Because we don't really know the exact cause of the mental illnesses. We're just like making assumptions. So even though we do have a general idea, we're, we're still a long ways to go to actually curing anything. Everything is just treatment right now. Questions, thoughts? Yes, Ava, yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Hi, yeah, Professor. Just one... oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Um, so I had a question about the second generation in the HT2A, um, how it can prevent EPS. Can you explain that again? I'm not understanding that. Yes. 5-HT2A is considered a dopamine uh, break. All right. A dopamine break more specifically in the nigrostriol area and the mesocortical area. So when you when you stimulate that, right, what's gonna happen is it's gonna break. So it's gonna decrease dopamine in the frontal lobe and decrease dopamine in the, in the nigrostriol area, which you don't want because you need dopamine there for movement and you need dopamine in the frontal lobe to actually focus. And that's gonna worsen negative symptoms. So what you wanna do is actually give them a 5-HE2A antagonist, which blocks the breaks so that someone can have increased dopamine in the frontal lobe and increased dopamine in the nigrostriol area. Does that make sense? So because you're increasing the dopamine, then that uh, will prevent the EPS. Yes, or less okay. likely. Yeah, less like I want to like I want to say prevent because we still see it sometimes, but it will be less likely. Okay, thank you. Drug companies will tell you that atypical antipsychotics cause zero EPS, and I laugh whenever they say that because it's we don't have any drugs that cause zero EPS. Even like I mentioned, quetiapine and clozapine, it's very rare. But if you look it up and research it, there's still case reports of people developing EPS on clozapine and quetiapine. So there is always a risk. You might be very low, but there's always a risk when, you, when you're playing with dopamine. Leave it out, uh, reglin, the clopramide, right? D2 antagonist, we use it for nausea. Take enough of it for a long enough time, you can actually develop time of and EPS. Maybe you guys a few minutes to digest this. It's, it's a lot of material, but if you understand the gist of it, it'll make more sense once you get to the clinical part. I am still trying to understand the upregulation, like the increase of dopamine causing tardive dyskinesia, because I thought that, you know, low dopamine causes tardive dyskinesia. So it's just I'm still trying to... No, it's not low dopamine. It's, it's, it's you know, let me rephrase it. If, don't worry about the neurotransmitter. Worry more on what's happening at the postsynaptic neuron, right? People have tardive dyskinesia. They have upregulated um, dopamine receptors and very sensitive dopamine receptors at the postsynaptic neuron in the nigrostriol area. Does that make sense? Because you're blocking the dopamine receptors there. They're very sensitive and they're upregulated. EPS, extraprimal, so dystonia and Parkinsonism, that happens early on because there's not enough dopamine because you're blocking the receptors. But eventually, it's going to upregulate to so your higher risk of tardive dyskinesia, which happens later on. It takes time for it to upregulate. Um, can I ask for the EPS? I know we talked about like the VMAT inhibitors for tardive dyskinesia and um, the anticholinergic for EPS, but like the other ones like the benzos and the beta blockers, did you want us to kind of know, because I know some are for some EPS symptoms and some are recommended for others. Like, do we need to get that specific in knowing this for the exam? Yeah, you should. Yeah, you should. Sorry, hold on. Sorry, those fires in Canada are messing up with the sciences. Um, so, uh, yes, akathisia. 
So akathisia is actually not a dopamine issue, which is why if you give someone anticholinergic medication, it doesn't do anything for akathisia, right? Akathisia is regulated through norepinephrine, right? It's kind of complicated, but we use beta blockers, uh, you know, propranolol for akathisia. Um, we also use mirtazapine, which is an alpha blocker and a 5 2 a antagonist at the same time. That might help with akathisia. And we also use benzos, GABA. It also helps with akathisia because we believe that it's hyperactivity of norepinephrine in the motor pathway that's causing the restlessness and the, you know, the movements, all right? So akathisia does not respond to um, anticholinergic medication. Beta blockers and benzos are first line. Mirtazapine would be second line, but I use it first line. I like mirtazapine. It works faster. And there's actually head-to-head -head studies with mirtazapine and Propranolol and mirtazapine works a lot quicker. Downside to, to mirtazapine is that it, it increases your appetite and cause weight gain, right? But it's not long-term. Usually akathisia can, can go away after a while. So I'll usually keep it on for like a month or two and then I'll wean it off. Obviously benzos, but I don't want to use benzos first line if I don't have to. So I, I usually reserve that for really treatment resistant akathisia. Questions about akathisia? Good question, by the way. Was you? just go over what you want us to know about inhibitors and inducers I, I struggle with that a little bit just know what they do just know what an inhibitor i'm not going to actually ask you what a specific inhibitor even though i want to but i'm i'm, I'm, I'm going to take it easy on you guys and, and not ask you specific meds but i want you to understand what they do right inhibitor will increase the plasma drug level of a medication and inducer will decrease the plasma drug level of medication Yes, Elliot. Uh, sorry for the repetitive question. Uh, just okay. one more time about the uh, 5-HT2A antagonist. Where would that increase dopamine in the brain? It would increase it in the frontal lobe and mm -hmm. uh, reduce uh, negative symptoms. And it'll also increase it in the nigrostriatal area, help in movements. Okay, thank you. And possibly, um, we didn't talk about prolactin too, hypoprolactinemia. You can help with that also. A question about uh, monitoring drug, drug levels. Uh, having not been to clinical yet, uh, what does that look like as far as like getting patients to have labs drawn and uh, insurance covering that and just compliance with that? I, I imagine that's probably really difficult at times. Yeah, it can be. Um, but, you know, I try to explain to the family or to the patient that's the best care, right? Um, really... The best way to treat schizophrenia effectively and get patients better is plasma drug levels, right? Every schizophrenia specialist that you go to does plasma drug levels. It's the only way. And, you know, I don't expect you guys to know that now, but you need to understand when you're practicing what, what the levels are, right? So I know for, I'm just giving you an example. It's not in the exam, but Abilify is 11 times daily dose, right? So if someone's an Abilify one milligram and I do a blood level at steady state, it should be 11 nanograms per ml, right? Risperidone is seven times the daily level. So if someone's Risperidone one, it will be seven, right? Uh, if someone is, is on Olanzapine, it's double the daily dose. Someone's on Olanzapine five milligrams, hit steady state, their level should be 10 nanograms per ml. Get it? So you should have a general understanding of, of what the levels are for those meds. When we have positive drug levels for almost all of the antipsychotic meds, except the, the really, really new ones, like Vralar, Caplita is not out yet, but we have levels for Latuda, Lorazidone. Do you have difficulty getting insurance to cover those drug levels? Oh, or? Oh, never rejected. Insurance pays for it. I order a lot of labs, actually. I order a lot. I, so I order a lot of labs when they first start. I always do a Chem 20. I always do CBC, thyroid, vitamin D25 hydroxy, lipids, B12 folates, uh, urinalysis, urine tox. Those are just my regular labs I order for everybody. And then based on what meds they're taking, I would have my own labs I order for them too. Thank you. I think there's a stigma sometimes, especially in psych where like, I've heard psychiatrists say this too, like uh, 
we just refer them to their primary care doctor to do labs because we don't we don't do medicine, right? We're just dealing with sex stuff. But good luck with a patient who's outpatient who doesn't. When was the last time they had a physical, right? So it's really our responsibility to to work almost like primary care. Oh, look, I'm not going to treat thyroid disorder, right? But I am going to do a TSH in a patient, and if TSH is abnormal, we'll refer them to endocrinologists because they might have a better report with you, and they might go to labs if you order it, and then waiting for them to go to the primary care, and you don't have anything. So I order labs pretty regularly, actually. You can tell all your psych RN colleagues that psych psychiatry isn't easy. And that's what they think, right? You're just a psych nurse. You're a psych NP. You don't do anything. And, and then my follow up to that is, is like monitoring, monitoring a QT, QT integral, um, QTC. Yeah, EKG is also very important. A lot of our drugs in, work on, on channels, right? Sodium and calcium channels, and that can really mess up the, the rhythms. So, yeah. Do some psych offices do EKGs in the office or you, you send oh, them? Oh, I usually, I, I send them out to urgent care if I need to, worst case scenario, get an EKG on file. Yeah. Oh, urgent, all right. I can, that. Like I have a few patients oh. I just start on clozapine and of course we need to do a baseline EKG to start them. I send them to urgent care and uh, they do the EKGs for me. Thank you. I know it's not totally relevant to this class. I just want to kind of get a general picture of what what's up ahead in clinical. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's fun. I do all that stuff. Just so you guys have an idea, I saw 25 patients today before I, I did this lecture, so I'm a little tired. That's what you look forward to when you guys start practicing. Anything else? I'm going to 9.30, so you got 10 minutes. Any questions? Well, I have a question. Yeah. On the test, are you going to want to give us like a scenario and know like what like our tr our first line treatment sec or second line treatment would be? Or are you more just focusing on like concepts and this type of thing? I can't really speak about the test. But oh, okay. I, did, I did look at the test and it's very fair. And I think that if you attended all my lectures and watched the videos and did majority of readings, um, you should pass. But if you want to get 100, you have to really, like, it's fair enough that if you understand just a bit, you're going to pass. But if you want to excel and get 100, you have to do a little extra, all right? And I'm hoping you all get 100. I'm rooting for you. It's all very fair. There's no trick questions. Um, yes. With the um, antipsychotics, um, there's a lot of differentiation. You know, each each medicine, you know, has a bunch of different targets, um, different receptor targets, and um, like how like how in depth are you expecting? Like, are we expected to like um, uh, know uh, or just know the main differences between a typical and typical? And um, right now, just know the, the main differences. Yeah. Okay. When you get the clinicals, I'm gonna expect you to know all the exact mechanisms of each specific pen. <laughs> I might actually be teaching uh, five, was it 517? I'm not sure yet if I'm gonna do that section or I might see some of you guys in clinicals. Yeah, I think, you you're, uh, I think your name is there for a clinical. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. All right, I guess they put me in already. All right. So if you wanna challenge yourself and you're in my section, I'm gonna expect you guys to know all that stuff. Yes, Ali, your hand raised or was that from before? Oh, uh, yeah, no. Um, so I had a quick question. Um, for the fear extinction um, that I was reading, so it, it seems like it's just like exposure therapy without the, uh, uh, I guess, like bad outcome or consequence from the stimulus. But do we use any medications for that? Yes, sorry, I'm like talking on my, uh, yes. 
So how fear works is that, you know, once those pathways are, are kind of formed, we don't really have a good way of removing it, right? You can't really remove new pathways. What we can do is reinforce other pathways to kind of override it. Now, a good example is, um, I think one of you guys emailed me about this, but the amygdala is hyperactive, for instance, right? Because you had a very bad sexual trauma when you were five years old, right? We can't get rid of that, right? It's not, it's not like uh, the Jim Carrey movie where you can just go on the machine and get rid of it. What we can do is get your frontal lobe to get strong enough, right? To tell you that, look, this happened 10 years ago. Now you're safe, right? Because if you don't process that, what happens is, you know, there's a lot of, of hypotheses for why people have PTSD, but one of it is that when you experience a very bad trauma, only one part of your brain is affected by that, right? For instance, maybe only if you're if you're left-handed, your right side was affected more and your left side didn't process it, right? Or the opposite, you're right-handed and your left-handed processed it, but your right side didn't, right? And what happens is when you do therapy like EMDR, right, which is eye movement desensitization, resensitization therapy, when you look left, you're stimulating what? The right side of your brain. When you look right, you're stimulating what? The left side of your brain. So what a, a trained therapist does, by the way, disclaimer, I'm not a, a EMDR therapist, but I do have an understanding of how it works, is that when you're when the therapist is doing a narrative and talking to you about, okay, let's walk back. Obviously, they're going to make sure you're safe and that you're comfortable to do it, is that when you're recanting that experience and going through a narrative and you're looking left, you're looking right, you're linking both sides of the brain again and you're processing it better. Now, that's the therapy part. Our job as psychopharmacologists are that I want to make sure that your senses are not dulled, right? I'm not going to give you a benzodiazepine. That's the last thing I'm going to do when you're doing processing for EMDR. But what I will do is maybe give you clonidine, right? Or maybe give you metropolol. Why? Tell me. Uh, what, what, how is that going to work? A beta blocker or an alpha-2 agonist? Okay. So there's a term called consolidation and reconsolidation. All right? I'm not going to details of you right now at this point, but when you go into trauma therapy, Consolidation means that that memory is, in, is put inside a certain part of your brain, right, in general. Reconsolidation means that when, when you talk about it and you go through a narrative, it reconsolidates again, right? Sometimes reconsolidation can backfire. Let's say, some, let's say you tell your dad that you were molested, whatever, right, or your mom, and they didn't validate you. They just say, oh, that's, you know, you're lying. Stop lying. That memory is going to get reconsol reconsolidated, but it's going to be even worse because not only are you going to feel what happened, you're going to relive that. You're going to feel shame that, that your, your parents didn't validate you. It's going to be even worse. So what you want to do, actually, is that when you do the, when you do the trauma narrative and you're giving them um, a beta blocker or, or clonidine, is that when it reconsolidates, that's going to imprint with a less blood pressure or less heart rate. So your sympathetic nervous system is actually going to be much lower. So then it reconsolidates and you relive that memory again, that biofeedback is going to be linked to that low heart rate and that low blood pressure. So when you go through it again, it's kind of like tricking your body to be relaxed. So you're kind of like psycho, uh, physiologically um, tricking your body to be in a relaxed state. Because what happens is if they relive that trauma and their, their fight or flight kicks in, which is normal, right? They're not on any medications. It's going to be so traumatizing. They can't process it, right? They're going to, they're going to go into fight or flight again. And the therapist won't even be able to like, they'll dissociate before the therapist even tells them they're in a safe place and it's not going to work. Does that make sense? I, I tried to simplify it, but in a general sense, that's how the meds work in trauma. So you want to bring down their fight or flight response and, and keep it at a threshold and that when they go to, to process it, they don't freak out and they don't dissociate. Gotcha. So like the main thing is like, it, it's never, you can't get rid of it. You just, you, can't get rid of it. you can just override it. Yeah. Override it with, you know, your frontal lobe. Gotcha. Thank you. That's, um, that's interesting information. I had actually gotten training in Ericksonian hypnotherapy and that was really what it was about. They had like this overlaying memory where they would just, once they were calm and relaxed, would rethink over the memory the way they would have liked it to turn out. And it did a similar thing by keeping them calm and overlaying, it sounds like. Thank you for sharing that. So, you know, sometimes I tell students when they're doing clinicals with me, like if you're doing a psych assessment and a patient has a trauma, like unless you're ready to process that trauma with the patient that day, do not bring it up. Right, don't have them do the narrative because you're going to re-traumatize them unless you're able to put them in a safe space. So if you mention something, have you ever had this? And they say yes. Okay, we'll keep that in the back of our mind, and we're going to go into go in detail with it in psychotherapy, but not at that day. You don't want to re-traumatize them because going back to that same concept, reconsolidation. Right? If you're not ready to process that trauma with them at that moment, don't open up that can of worms. What was that? 
Question? Uh, Professor Callao, this is a little bit uh, about, okay, so uh, sexual dysfunction is obviously very problematic with all these medications for women and men. Um, but for men, in terms of uh, Cialis or any other medications, uh, how does he, I, I know that eventually I will learn about those things, but Cialis and all these medications, how they interact? I prescribe, I prescribe Cialis and Viagra to patients who are stable and SSRIs who have, you know, who are struggling with their sex life because the meds are working. It's a risk benefits thing, right? Sometimes they don't want to get off the SSRI because they, they, they finally feel like themselves, but it's causing sexual side effects. So they, they don't, they're afraid. I'll try the Wellbutrin and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but if the Wellbutrin doesn't work or sometimes it's performance anxiety, right? Like this whole time they were on, they've been on SSRIs for a long time and that their sexual functioning has always been bad. That like they have kind of like a, um, what's that what's that called uh, they're like conditions to like not so it's performance anxiety so what i'll do is i'll give them maybe you know a, a week's worth of like viagra that they can use just to kind of get their performance up just to kind of get them out of that 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 rut that makes sense but you can prescribe as a psychiatric provider we can prescribe any medications that are for the side effects of our medications get it like you're not treating sexual dysfunction right you're going to treat SSRI induced sexual dysfunction, not primary sexual dysfunction, that which might be caused by a cardiac issue, right? That would be outside of your scope. But if you know that he had sexual regular sexual functioning before they were put on the Prozac, then of course you would assume that it's Prozac causing it. And then you would you can give them PRN, um, you know, Viagra Cialis, whatever. Does um, the um, do the uh, sexual dysfunction symptoms um, do they? go away after a person stops taking SSRIs or is that something that's kind of lingers around? You know, I was, uh, I was attending a lecture actually and uh, it was uh, a psychiatrist from England and England recognizes that there's something called persistent antidepressant sexual dysfunction. So that answers your question. They, they appreciate that in England that even someone who gets off the SSRIs, they still have long lasting sexual dysfunction. But we don't, we don't appreciate that in the States. And even, of course, the drug companies don't want to bring that up at all. But it's interesting in Europe that that's, that's a thing. But here in America, no. But if a patient asked me and I wanted to be ethical and answer, yes, it could happen. It's a risk. And we don't know the exact mechanisms as to why that happens. Which is why we're moving away from a lot of the SSRIs now. You notice a lot of the new meds that are coming out are NMD antagonists, right? Obelity, A-U-B-E-L-I-T-Y. It's actually... Um, Wellbutrin and Samidorphin. We don't really care about the, the Wellbutrin is just there for a pharmacokinetic issue. We're using the Samidorphin, I'm sorry, Sam, uh, Dextromatorphin, I'm sorry, which is actually cough suppressant because it's an NMDA antagonist. And the Wellbutrin is a 2D6 inhibitor. So it's actually keeping the, um, the Dextromatorphin longer. So it's a once a day pill, right? If you just put Dextromatorphin and you took cough medicine, it only lasts like two or four hours, right? Two to four hours and it'll go away. But by giving them an inhibitor, you're actually using the pharmacokinetics of Wellbutrin to make the med last longer. Interesting, right? So we're, we're hoping eventually we can move away from monoamine reuptake pumps and we'll stay, and eventually we'll, we won't have those side effects to worry about. And we also, if you move away from dopamine blockade with antipsychotics, you might not have to deal with tardive dyskinesia or EPS, you know, in the future with patients. Good question. Any other questions? So is that basically mean that it's actually a condition more than just a symptom, like something that should be treated separately than just, uh, you know, here's uh, Cialis, you know? No, it, it's still a new phenomenon that we're, that we're kind of like appreciating. So I don't really know what the, the treatment's going to be for that long term. Yeah. You know, who knows? Who knows what, what it does to the brain? Who knows if it's actually something that has to do with like the actual penis itself, right? Or something that's CNS. Who knows? I don't really know. Yeah. That's why I like psychiatry. There's a lot of unknowns, right? And that's why when, when you start practicing, you should read journals and you should. So, you know, even though I'm not, I've, I've been out of school for years now, I still read a journal. I, I still keep up to date. As you guys know, I'm, I understand a lot of this stuff. And it, it's not by accident. I, I work hard to understand all this stuff. I read a lot of books. I read a lot of journals. Um, and a lot of learning is going to happen once you're practicing. Because the thing is, my fear 
is to give patients sub subpar care, right? So if any patient, if I ever hurt a patient by not knowing what I'm doing, I would, I would hate myself. So I don't want that to happen. So whenever I'm practicing, I want to make sure I'm practicing at the top of my level, right? Especially now that NPs have full practice autonomy, right? Obviously after 3,600 hours, that's only about two years of practice. So, you know, you should hold yourself to a high standard to make sure that you guys know this well, especially if you're going to be doing, you know, private practice. You know, what irks me more is students like, well, I graduate, I want to start a private practice. All right, good luck. You know, what are you going to do? You're going to follow algorithms and you can buy the style book and say, okay, depression, Prozac, depression, certainly, you know, schizophrenia, how do But that's going to have its limits because you don't really understand the mechanisms of the meds. And someone comes to you on three or four medications and you can't tell, is it a pharmacodynamic issue? Is it a pharmacokinetic issue? Is there a reason why these meds aren't working? Where do I go, right? You don't really know. So, you know, if you really want to treat patients and, and get a lot of them well, you have to understand all these mechanisms. It's not just textbook, it's, it's clinical too. There's a lot of clinical applications to a lot of this stuff. I'm actually, I, I spoke to, um, uh, oh my God, uh, Dr. Malazzo. I'm, I'm hoping that maybe next year I want to do a, a child psych class, a child, uh, a child psychopharmacology class just specifically for child psych, because it's like its own beast. And I feel like sometimes you guys don't get enough training in it. Not that anyone, I don't know if any of you guys want to do child psych, but I think it needs its own course. And we can really go, because a lot of the meds don't work the same in children. And you need to have an understanding of, of why they don't work. Well, let's get through this course first. All right, I know it's a lot. Um, really just understand you know, the, the big parts and if you understand the big parts of it, you can kind of like deduce what the answer is going to be, right? And the questions are very fair. There's no trick questions. And there's a few questions there that I didn't go over, but those are there because, you know, like I said, if you didn't go above and beyond and do all the readings, you're not going to get 100, right? Because I'm not going to spoon feed you all the stuff. You're going to pass, but you're not going to get 100 unless you actually do all the readings, not just the stuff that I'm going over. Or you might get 100, you might get a lucky guess. I'm not, I'm not going to say you're not going to get it. Maybe, I hope so. Yes, Roy. Question. Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Okay, um, you might have said that earlier, but um, how many questions and then how many, how many minutes we have? Uh, you have one hour, unless you have accommodations, and there's uh, 50 questions. And then you cannot skip and go back, right? No, no. Okay. Why would you want to skip though? <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, if you're going to skip a question, you're not going to get it right. Just you know, trust your instinct. Um, I just uh, I just want to bring something up for week five. I was just looking through all the week five, um, you know. Um, readings that we have to do and uh so specifically for week five i noticed that it had week one's reading so I, I just don't want that to be an issue like when we get to that week i'm sorry what was week five again i'm not know. week five um i think uh it, it's showing us like it's it's showing us the readings that we did what, what's the topic i'm sorry what's the topic for week five um opiates and analgesia Oh, Professor Smith is here. I didn't realize he was here in the room. <laughs> uh, silent. Um, yeah, I'll, I, I will fix that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, some things may have not been ported over um, from the, the working class into the active classes. Any, any questions? So this is, you know, like I said, this test is very fair. You know, if you guys did your reading and have a general understanding, there's no trick questions there. All right. Trust in yourself that, that you guys are prepared for this. All right. We're not, we're, we're not trying to fail you. You know, really, if you fail, it's because you weren't doing the readings. And, and honestly, you're going to thank me four years from now and Professor Smith when you guys are practicing and, and you guys know your stuff. All right. I'm doing you a favor by, by really making you guys understand this stuff. So you're yeah. treating people and it's lives in the line. All right. Yeah, all the questions essentially come right from the required readings in the edit in your book. And any other questions? And actually for this test, backtracking is allowed. Um, it's kind of a gift. 
Um, it probably won't be in future tests, so, you know, you can make use of it. Anything else? Any other questions? I recommend you guys put my YouTube playlist on low and you can go to sleep and it'll help you fall asleep and you guys will subliminally understand everything. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. I really appreciate you, um, you know, attending tonight. I know it's, it's a long night, but you guys are going to do great tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.